Okay, it is six o'clock, so I think we will begin. So it's my great pleasure to welcome both members and non-members of the Thorsby Society to this evening's lecture. If you haven't muted yourself, please do so to avoid background noise. Please note that this meeting is being recorded, so anything you say is saved for, for posterity. But there'll be time at the end for questions, and you can ask a question either by using the chat function during the talk, or at the end of the talk, if you wish to ask a question in the more traditional way, please feel free to unmute yourself, and you can then ask the question without having to type it into the chat function. So it's a great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. John Turney. Dr. Turney qualified at Cambridge and King's College London, and he came to Leeds in 1983, where he served as a consultant regional physician at Leeds General Infirmary. And since his retirement, he's been pursuing his interest in the history of medicine. And he last spoke to us about the history of dialysis. So I have great pleasure in asking you, John, to give your talk tonight on Thomas Nullany, 1809-1870, Surgery, Audit and Politics. Thank you, John. Thank you. I'll share my screen. Is that visible to all? OK, yes. good evening and thank you to the Thorsby Society for giving me the opportunity to talk about Thomas Nunnally, a lead surgeon uh, during the 19th century. Oh. Right. Uh, the talk is as much about the General Infirmary at Leeds as it is about Nunnally himself. From its inception, the LGI had a reputation as a center of surgical excellence, initially with William Hay, and then through the 19th century and 20th century. Um, but in the 19th century, there were a number of surgeons with national and international reputations, the Hay family, the Prigentils, uh, Wheelhouse, um, uh, Moynihan, of course, um, and the surgical activity of the LGI is really the subject for tonight. So this is Nunnally in a formal portrait, the only portrait I can find. He came from a comfortably off family, was privately educated, and as was the custom in those days, he was apprenticed to a local surgeon but he could then afford to go to Guy's Hospital uh, for a year as the dresser or junior assistant for the preeminent surgeon of the day, Sir Astley Cooper, and he also spent time in Paris. I have no idea why he chose to come to Leeds to practice, but I suspect it's because of its reputation for surgical excellence. In 1835, he unsuccessfully applied for a position at the LGI, but nevertheless set up a, a thriving private practice in Leeds. 1843 was a good year for him. He was appointed surgeon to the Leeds Eye Hospital, a lecturer at the Leeds Medical School, which had been founded only a decade or so before, and was also one of the original 300 who were uh, uh, elected as fellows of the Royal College of Surgeons. He built a large successful surgical practice, primarily on the basis of eye surgery, but he was a general surgeon as well. And he was eventually appointed honorary surgeon to the LGI in 1864. This was the apogee of the local career because the honorary surgeons who were not paid, but it gave a tremendous boost to their private practice. In the interim, he produced lots of publications, textbooks on anesthesia, erysipelas anatomy, and particularly ophthalmic surgery, 
uh, a book that was widely used. Erysipelas, I should explain, is an infection due to streptococcus and covers such unpleasantnesses as childbed fever, post-operative infections, gangrene, all sorts of very nasty things. And his book is actually very well written and very thoughtful. He had multiple publications in medical journals on operative technique, ophthalmic physiology, and the effects of anesthetics. And he had even more publications on anything controversial. He either initiated the con controversy or joined in. So that there are over 600 entries in the Lancet and the British Medical Journal by him or about him. He was politically active. He was briefly a town councillor of the liberal persuasion. More importantly, he was very active in the Provincial Medical Association, which became the British Medical Association, locally, regionally, and was for very many years elected to the council, the National Council. He was also served on the Council of the Royal College of Surgeons, and perhaps most significantly, he was the lead negotiator for the BMA, negotiating with the government before the, the great Medical Reform Act of 1859. He dabbled in forensic medicine and studied, uh, published studies on an anaesthetic toxicity, the effects of cyanide, and also on the Calabar bean, much loved of Sherlock Holmes. He was an expert witness in the notorious Palmer case of 1855. These were the Rougely murders. Um, but the Lancet in an editorial thought that his evidence made a rather sorry display. He was more successful in the Leeds Dove case uh, the following year, where he and others showed that the victim had been poisoned with arsenic. I'm going to talk about his surgical audit and I'm going to suggest that this was the world's first and original systematic audit of medical practice. So what was surgery like in the 19th century? If you had money, you avoided the hospitals and any surgery that was necessary was done in the house, um, on the dining room table, and you will see that the surgeons are wearing their normal clothes. The lead surgeon, I hope you can see my pointer, the lead surgeon does have an apron on, but that would have been far from clean. Victorian surgery had overwhelming challenges. The first and most terrible was hospitalism. That's acquired infection from the surgery. And Nunnally himself was an expert in this and had written extensively. He then had the problem of contamination of the wounds if somebody had been involved in an accident and including a real problem with tetanus because of, there were so many horses and the tetanus spores uh, survive in, the, in horse manure. Because of these risks of infection, internal surgery in the abdomen, chest or head was essentially impossible. The other problem was, of course, they had no way of visualizing what was going on inside, no x-rays on it. So if they did open an abdomen, they would have no idea of what they were going to meet. There was no system or method of um, dealing with blood loss. There were no blood transfusions. And pain relief, apart from uh, opium derivatives, was not good. In the late 1860s, Joseph Lister introduced his <coughs> system for antiseptic surgery, which was essentially spraying carbolic acid over the surgeon, the patient, and generally in the atmosphere. Um, and here is a... Uh, a woodcut of, a, um, of an operation, you will see the uh, 
carbolic acid spray coming from here. There'll be a jar of anesthetic there that would be dropped on the um, rag across the patient's mouth. But you'll see that the surgeons are wearing their day clothes. There are no gloves or masks. There was no concept of asepsis. And therefore, the spread of infection from the surgeon uh, was a very real risk. Operating theatres were literally theatres. And the well-known surgeon would demonstrate his techniques to all and sundry. His colleagues, medical students, even members of the general public were allowed entry into the theatre to watch the great man work um, and spread germs. There's the anesthetic uh, device there, but there's no sign of carbolic acid. And although the surgeon's taken his overcoat off, he's still wearing his ordinary uh, clothes, no gloves, wooden table. So what is surgical audit? <coughs> Excuse me. NICE defines it as the collection of data of all surgical cases followed by ongoing review and assessment of performance and outcomes. What little historiography of audit there is uh, names Ernest Codman, an otherwise undistinguished uh, doctor in Massachusetts who kept a list of operations. Um, I'm going to suggest that he was some 50 years behind the times. So, in early 1870, three big articles by Nunnally appeared in The Lancet. Remember that The Lancet was then, and arguably still is, the premier medical journal. Um, and in, this, in these articles, he lists all the major operations performed at the LGI. He called them capital operations. This was over a 16 and a half year period, and the dates are significant. Prior to 1852, the junior staff at the infirmary were somewhat haphazard in their record keeping, but from late 52, they were required to keep systematic records. May 1869 was the date of the closure of the old LGI. And for Nunnally, this was a significant date. So just to remind you, <clears throat> the first purpose-built uh, infirmary in Leeds was on what became Infirmary Street, and you'll see um, Holy Trinity in the background. It was, it, the central part was the first part, and it was built, as was the fashion, along the lines of a, a sort of grand country house with lots of little rooms, lots of little wards. The demand for its services was such that two wings were added, but nevertheless, the demand uh, overwhelmed the facilities, so a new infirmary was required. And this is the iconic Gilbert Scott LGI phase one, and I will take you on a little walk around it. <coughs> Excuse me again. It had old as features as well as new innovative features. The chapel was central and would be even more central as phases two, three, four, whatever, were built uh, along this way. It had a grand entrance, absolutely wonderful entrance, where the honorary surgeons and physicians could go in as well as the benefactors and su subscribers. And, um, but everybody else came through the tradesman's entrance, which was around here, um, which opened into a covered courtyard. Opposite it was a purpose-built, very fine medical school with a convenient entrance for the students through the tradesman's entrance. But the important part of the infirmary were these pavilion blocks of um, wards. Because of the slope of the site, 
three stories high at the front, two at the back. These were very long open wards with services at the end and with huge windows to allow a throughput of air to um, avoid infection. And I will also point you to this structure, I hope you can see it, which is the glass lantern over the operating theatre to increase the light into the operating theatre. And it shows that the operating theatre was central to the whole functioning of the building. And here's a picture just to show these great big windows and, uh, and the blocks, it's a little bit newer than eight, uh, 1865. So what did Nunnally write? He gave a list of all operations, the ages of the patients, the results and the immediate post-operative deaths with an extensive discussion of his findings. These were not just his uh, cases, they were the cases of the entire hospital. He excluded minor surgery in outpatients and also eye operations, which as he pointed out, however delicate, can hardly be called important as affecting the ratio of hospital mortality. So we're gonna go through some tables and I'm gonna pick bits out. In this 16 and a half year period, there were 1,729 major operations with an overall mortality of 16%, made rather good by the 0% mortality in plastic operations. A third, a full third of the operations were amputations of limbs or parts of limbs. And we will go into those in more detail because they tell us quite a lot. But then one in five of those patients died in the post-operative period. The mortality for hernias and for ovariotomy, a third of the patients died. And for other uh, surgery, the mortality was up to 60%. So let's look at the amputations in more detail. The amputations, the mortality, if we go down this column, the old, uh, mortality, though overall not bad for the uh, upper limb surgery, got worse the more, the, uh, the bigger the operation. And the same in the legs. So major um, amputations through the thigh or through the hip, a third of the patients would die. The amputations show us quite a lot about the surgery because Nunnally initially lumped together all emergency operations and also planned operations, acute and elective. The elective surgery was for what he called pathological limbs, which would have included tumours, tuberculosis and deep-seated infection of bone called osteomyelitis. Acute amputations were for trauma, and that could be major soft tissue trauma or hemorrhage, but mainly for compound fractures. A compound fracture is where a long bone has been fractured and has penetrated through the soft tissue to the surface. It is open to the air and was invariably fatal in those days from infection either well, from uh, contamination acquired at the time of accident. So many of these acute amputations were for uh, compound fractures and there were a horrifying number of them. Um, sorry, I've, there. Yeah. So 233 patients had arm or part of an arm amputated and 122 uh, had amputations of the leg. And the mortality for these traumatic amputations was horrendous. 
So three quarters of those who lost a whole leg died in the post-operative period. Now, what were these injuries? Well, these injuries were primarily from injuries from machinery in the factories and the mills. Unguarded machinery, no health and safety. And the other major cause were, were road traffic accidents caused by carts and horses. And a horrifying number of children seem to get mixed up in the wheels of carts and suffer really horrendous injuries. I won't go into details of some of the injuries that uh, Nunnally uh, describes, but they would, they, they were just awful. Um, and they would be a challenge even to a 21st century major trauma centre like the LGI or the Royal London. You can see that when the operation was planned, the mortality by and large was half. It was about 20% um, for legs uh, amputations, as opposed to overall about 40%. So acute emergency surgery carried a heavy mortality. I mentioned strangulated hernias. There are 111 operations over this time period and 38 deaths. Nunley pointed out that the fear of surgery was such that uh, medical practitioners spent a long time attempting to reduce hernias and frequently left it too late. So the patients were already desperately ill before they were sent to the infirmary. And the main problem was gangrene of the, of the bowel trapped inside these hernias. Not only demonstrated that dealing with these complicated hernias was perfectly safe with no deaths unless the peritoneum had to be uh, opened and the bowel operated on when nearly all of the patients died. And these show the dire consequences of infection resulting from the lack of antisepsis and asepsis. An area that I find interesting is the number of bladder stones that were operated on. Not a pleasant operation, even with attempting to smash the stone, which is what a lithotomy is. And if you want to read about how horrendous bladder stone removal by perineal section is, then Samuel Pepys in his diaries describes it in graphic detail. He survived, uh, but there was a significant mortality. The other strange thing about Nunnally's series is that 40% of the patients with bladder stones that required surgery were aged less than 10 years. I don't think in the modern world you ever see a child with a bladder stone. The plastic surgery was very safe, very effective, and Nunnally uh, said that all the patients were either cured or relieved, which I suppose is a partial curve. And they were doing quite complex surgery on the face, uh, hair, lips and cleft palate, also on nevus, which are birthmarks essentially. But what I want to draw your attention to is the number who, who required surgery for scarring following burns. Burns were very common in the 19th century. Most of the victims were children, but there was a preponderance of females. So adult women and girls and it was a result of open fires and uh, their full dresses made of flammable material. And those that survived their burns were often left with crippling scars, which prevented, for example, movement of the elbow. And the surgery was to restore some function in the burnt limb. 
not only was it pains to show that the success of the surgery at the LGI was improving, but he only quotes two years, so I can't say anything more about it. Um, but he was at pains to point out that in the final year, the overall mortality was only 4%, which must have been significantly better than preceding years. And he was at pains to point out that there was a similar workload and severity. But this is, comes to the heart of Nunnally's message. This, it be it re recollected, was the last period of occupation of the infirmary, which had been in use for a hundred years. I will come back to that in a moment. A bit more about the patients who died. Basically, the older the patient, the less chance of survival, and essentially those that died were on average twice as old as those that survived. If we just look at the successes here for the um, amputations, in the acutely, they were remarkably young. This is the average age. So there were a lot of children in here, children working in the mills and factories. Um, and it really is appalling how young the patients were. Okay, so none of his conclusions. He, he believed that he demonstrated that mortality had declined over the period of study that the mortality increased with age, whatever the operation, that the death rate in emergency surgery was hugely greater than in planned elective surgery. At least a quarter of the operations performed at the, uh, at the infirmary were for accidents. He demonstrated that the outcome from a major trauma was determined to a very great extent by the degree of blood loss and other associated injuries about which the surgeons could do nothing. He de demonstrated that intra-abdominal surgery was ine inevitably fatal. And he also found some deaths that were due to non-surgical factors uh, because the patient was a drunk or caught diphtheria and two died from the effects of chloroform. His conclusions further showed he felt that the audit of the um, of surgical practice improved the standard of practice, which is very much the message of today. And he also said that all institutions should be obliged to publish results. And he being an awkward man, hinted more than hinted that other surgeons and other institutions avoided the worst cases to make their figures look better. Now, what was he really trying to say? In 1869, the old inf infirmary was replaced by the new. The iconic uh, Gilbert Scott Pavilion Hospital for which Florence Nightingale had been a consultant was characterized by very large airy wards, which Nunnally hated. We call them Nightingale wards. <clears throat> he had other words. And he hated them because he believed that packing 30 or 40 patients into one room increased the risk of cross infection or hospitalism and that the lack of privacy and the noise and distress to the patients, which he describes as the noise and confusion of visitors tramping about cannot but be most prejudicial to any who is seriously ill or injured or has lately undergone a capital operation. He was at pains to demonstrate the excellent outcomes in the old LGI, and he was a strong advocate of the conditions in private practice, which was the patient's home or nursing homes, of which there were a number up Clarendon Road, where patients had a private room and were not disturbed. And just to remind you of the layout of the LGI, these are the Nightingale wards. 
And this in the plan has 32 beds in, but the LGI rapidly got a reputation for never turning anybody away. And when it was at, under pressure, it just jammed more beds in so that the wards would have 40 or maybe 50 patients with beds down the center and even beds down the corridor. The chance of cross infection was huge. None of this paper resulted in a torrent of reaction led by Thomas Jessup. <coughs> Jessup was a surgeon at the LGI and was actually Nunnally's assistant. And he went on to be appointed honorary surgeon after Nunnally's death. And his letter in February 1870 is, well, it, it's just so rude. <laughs> um, the Lancet, maybe a premier medical journal, but was founded in 1832 as essentially the private eye of medicine. And it was keen to have contentious items in it. And the letters and articles published in the 19th century would not be published nowadays because they are frequently libelous. So let's go through this letter from Jessup. You know, none of his colleague. The bit in um, italics is a, an ironic quote from the introduction of none of his uh, papers. And essentially what Jessup is saying is that none of can't count. Um, any mortal thing may be proved by statistics would certainly have good reason for so saying if statisticians were not more careful in their arithmetic than is Mr. Nunnally. I've been through all the numbers in Nunnally's papers and recalculated everything. <coughs> he was on occasion guilty of a little bit of rounding up, but otherwise his statistics are correct. He then, <coughs> sorry, he then goes on to this. By what arithmetical process Mr. Nunnally arrives at such conclusions, I am at a loss to divine, unless he prefers that backward reckoning by which Lord Dundreary counts his fingers and makes them number 11. I shall await with considerable curiosity the promised deductions from such faulty premises. This reference to Lord Dundreary is very insulting. Here is Lord Dundreary, who was an actor. Well, he wasn't, he was a character in a very popular, amusing play called Our American Cousin. And the lead actor was portrayed as a good natured, but brainless aristocrat, a sort of Tim Nice but Dim, of the 19th century. It was so popular that Dun the word Dundreary went into uh, popular language. So a Dundrearyism was a nonsensical aphorism like birds of a feather gather no moss. The actor had very full whiskers and these became known as Dundreary whiskers and were actually quite fashionable for a period and they were also known as Piccadilly weepers. So not only did um, Jessup suggest that his colleague was brainless and incapable of counting, but I think he makes a personal comment about him. If you compare these whiskers with Nunnally's rather uh, verdant mutton chops. So back to Nunnally. Was this just a flash in the pan? No. Nunnally was a controversial character. 
There was a long and increasingly irascible correspondence in The Lancet about his evidence and the evidence of other people in the Palmer case. Then for several years, whilst he was negotiating about um, uh, uh, for the Medical Reform Act, uh, he indulged in heated correspondence about medical education. But the real tipping point came in 1869 when he was invited to give the very prestigious address in surgery at the BMA annual meeting. This lecture must have gone on for two or three hours. Uh, no danger of that tonight. Um, because it runs to many pages uh, in the BMA and Lancet. And through it, he does it a wide ranging review of the state of surgery, but he doesn't pull his punches when he's um, attacking other surgeons. He has a long section on Joseph Lister's method of antisepsis, which he calls a professional error founded on false facts. Within a week, there was a letter in the BMJ from one of the Leeds honorary surgeons, one of the Prigentiel family, and from Joseph Lister himself, where they state categorically that his views are not shared by his colleagues at LGI. There clearly was ruction between Nunnally and his colleagues. And then Jessup piled in by challenging his claim to have invented a particular surgical procedure. But there was yet more con controversy. When he was appointed an honorary surgeon, there was a lot of local ill feeling. I suspect that this was for two reasons. One, he was not related to any of the other surgeons, like the Hay dynasty or the Prigentiel dynasty. And even worse, he wasn't even a Yorkshireman. Um, as a result of this, Nunnally sent a letter to the Lancet. Now remember, the Lancet loved controversial things, but the editor wrote a piece saying that they'd received a letter from Nunnally, but it was too libelous for them to print. So it must have been pretty rich. The following year, he resigned from the medical school in a fit of pique because the printer had omitted his name from the prospectus and he got into a real huff. The medical school tried to pacify him by electing him an honorary member of the school council and he had been president three times previously, but he uh, responded to their generosity by suing them for a higher retirement fee. So he was, um, he was quite pugnacious. But in the same year, he forked out a huge amount of money to pay for the stone carving of the windows in the new medical school. But quite typical for him, he had an ulterior motive because although he paid this money, he did it in the name of his son, John, who was an aspiring surgeon in Leeds to enhance John's chance of being uh, appointed to the infirmary. And this is the old medical school, appropriately <clears throat> in Thorsby Place, rather fuzzy old photograph and a rather fuzzy new photograph, but you can just about make out the ornate carving in the stonework which Nunnally paid for at huge expense. So he was a difficult uh, character to, um, to understand. Shortly after the publication of his, his major work, his health was visibly deteriorating, but being obstinate, he continued working and even operating until three weeks before he died. His final illness was described in detail in the BMJ and he had blood in his water, spontaneous bruising and became increasingly drowsy and confused. Following his death by prior arrangement, one of the other honorary uh, surgeons, Samuel Hay of that ilk, um, 
performed a post-mortem which was published in the BMJ, which showed he had a huge heart, shrunken kidneys, and that his death had been from kidney failure. A long obituary appeared in the BMJ, and I apologize for this long quote, but it really rather sums up the, the man himself. So uh, obituaries in the BMJ are anonymous, so I have no idea who wrote it, but probably one of his colleagues. A man of strong feelings, somewhat impetuous in action and of great decision in character, which is a, a polite way of saying he was obstinate. The straightforward, uncompromising manner in which he promulgated his opinions may not always have been palatable to those who held opposite views, but even those who differed from him on controversial subjects could not withhold their deep and sin sincere admiration of his great abilities and attainments. So Nali is largely forgotten nowadays amongst the well-known names at the LGI. But I believe that he probably conducted the first and complete accurate analysis of a hospital surgical activity anywhere in the world. The conclusions that he drew remain true today. Emergency surgery is much more dangerous than elective surgery. Uh, other injuries um, uh, can affect the outcome. Uh, the young do better than the older patients. It was a century before his method of uh, surgical audit became standard practice. And sadly, his contribution remains unacknowledged in the histories of audit. Thank you for your patience. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, John, for that marvellous lecture, rich in information. We now have time for questions. If anybody would like to ask a question, either type it please into the chat box or better still, unmute yourself and ask the question in the standard way. Uh, we can have I ask John, so somebody beaten me to it. So yes, can I just deal with the chat question? Jane asks, do you think he admitted eye surgery? What's the question now? Uh, from the audit, because he did not want to highlight mortality rates from that type of surgery. Uh, the mortality rate was naught, and he... Um, uh, um, so, so he omitted it because it had no effect on the overall, well, it, it falsely improved the overall results. Um, so, yeah. Where did Nunnally reside, John? Where Sorry? did he live? Where did Nunnally live, you know, and what was his I don't know. life? Well, he had a son, so he must have had some sort of social life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I know absolutely nothing about his his private life. Um, I think I did see a reference to his house, but I've forgotten. Sorry. That's work to be done. Uh, yes. <laughs> we have two questions in the chat function. Uh, one is, are his records still retained by the LGI? And if they're not at the LGI, where are they now? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> the LGI records are a, a problem. Uh, there are some in the, um, in the archive, the uh, uh, West Yorkshire archive. Um, his, his figures, his original working notes, I don't think are available. So what we're left with are his published figures, which may or may not have been massaged. And there's another question which I don't understand, but you will because... Oh, bloodletting. Yes, was bloodletting yeah. common for surgical patients? In, in surgical patients? Uh, no, their big problem was that too much blood had been let uh, in, in uh, 
either at operation or in um, uh, because of the original accident. I have to say, Victorian surgeons were incredibly skillful. They had to work very fast, very accurately, and of course, they didn't have all the the plastic, all the equipment and the plastics uh, and, and, and that we have now. Thank you. So somebody else was was asking a question when they, I interrupted them to go over to the chat function. Would you like to ask your question now, please? Um, I, I was going to ask John, I think it's maybe a question I've asked you before in another context, but the renal stone, the, the, the bladder uh, are, are surely fascinating because you, you don't see adults or children with bladder stones very much now. Did they keep, did they just not drink enough or was there something wrong with the water or what, what, what's your theory? There are lots of theories. They were apparently particularly common in East Anglia. They're common enough everywhere. So one of the theories is a grain-based diet, almost exclusively farinaceous diet, mm. somehow affected it. Mm. They certainly didn't drink much. I mean, nobody would drink the water <laughs> out of choice. Um, and uh, so they drank beer instead. But it is a mystery that to, has never been explained to my satisfaction, but stones were incredibly common. I mean, in my practice over, over the years, I saw one. <laughs> uh, the urologist would have seen more, but uh, these bladder stones were originally kidney stones that had gone down and then got bigger and bigger, and they didn't operate until they were so huge that they were obstructing the bladder. These things were like oranges or grapefruits. So we have a, a message from Bill who says he always hesitates to correct you, but he claims that the site of the medical school, the 1865 medical school, was in Park Street and not Thorsby Place. It's called Thorsby Place now, isn't it? Okay, so... Well, okay, it was in Park <laughs> Street. That, well. Let's not worry too much about that. Are there any other questions that anyone would like to ask? Yes, uh, Kevin Grady here. Um, well, three things really, John. One is, um, how did you get to be a honorary surgeon at the infirmary? If, if you were uh, elected, I suppose, how long was your tenure? How easy was it to kick you out? And then of course, clearly, has there been a long standing tradition of surgeons at the infirmary falling out with each other and <laughs> out of each other's abilities? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, the infirmary <coughs> surgery at the infirmary was had a, a great reputation for its quality and its skill and its innovation. Also, has a over the centuries had a great reputation for surgeons falling out big time um, and at times actually coming to blows. So they were all pretty um, feisty characters. <laughs> uh, you became an honorary surgeon. The voluntary hospitals, as, as you know, were paid for by subscribers and benefactors. The Honorary surgeons received no salary until 1947. Um, and, but appointment as an honorary surgeon to one of the great voluntary hospitals established you in your private practice. So it was a, a great money spinner. You, you were the, the top dog. The LGI, like many places, the appointments had a tendency to be hereditary. Either the Hay family, the Prison Teal family, or their various nephews or married to their nieces. So it wasn't, the competition for these places was not as open as it might have been. Jessup himself 
was involved in um, a rather nefarious um, dealings to ensure that Barclay Moynihan, the up and coming surgeon, was assured of being appointed. So he arranged for Barclay Moynihan to become engaged to his, to Jessup's daughter. Unfortunately, Moynihan was already engaged to another lady. Um, so Jessup paid her off and gave her enough money to set her up for life as a school teacher, run her own private school. Um, so there was a lot of in in um, in the uh, what's the phrase um, insider dealing on this, um, and uh, even until late in the twentieth century, you really had to be a Leeds graduate to become a uh, a, a lead surgeon. Fascinating. Patrick asks, how many people were working in the medical school from eighteen sixty five? I don't know. Sorry, I, I will find that out. There, there were a number of lecturers in various subjects, um, and the the honorary surgeons were also obliged to teach students who, who did a sort of apprenticeship, essentially. Um, but I, I can't give you numbers. Sorry, it's a good question, actually. Yeah. Do we have any other questions for John? Yeah, it's Martin Mears, John. Thank you very much indeed. I was interested to know whether this data that he published, John, did have any impact at all, either locally or nationally? Was it just a paper that got lost? Or was the idea of counting things, which then I suppose must have become a little more popular after Florence Nightingale, did that have an influence at all? Or was it just a standalone study of this, which left... <laughs> I think pages and nobody looked at it. it was ignored. I, it, it, I've, I've never, never seen a reference to it. Um, uh, that it, it, it just fell by the wayside. Um, I think the other great oh. institutions, the London hospitals or whatever, uh, occasionally published figures, but not very often. And these they tended to be selected cases, you know, you know the numbers of, of, of variotomies they'd done in the previous 10 years or something like that. Um, and no, it just disappeared. As indeed, I think Nunnally himself disappeared after his death. He was forgotten. Well, do we have any more questions? Yeah, oh, Kevin again. Well, I'm just, just wondering, John, you, you, you're sort of lecturing on miscellaneous topics to do with <laughs> medicine and health indeed. Is, is there a book? What, what's your general strategy? Are you going to produce a book or is it more articles or how, how, how are you progressing all this? I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a historian monkey compared with uh, others. My main work, which is is the relates to the history of renal medicine, dialysis, and particularly acute renal failure, um, which, and, but currently I'm working on uh, life before Richard Bright, what they knew about the kidneys there uh, with, with a colleague from Leeds. Um, but I, I like these because it's all quite interesting. <laughs> At least I think it is. And in fact, I came across none of his paper when I was looking for something else, actually the history of, uh, of kidney failure. And you know, one always reads the articles either side of the ones you should be reading. Thank you. So there is a book <laughs> and uh, there are a number of papers around. <laughs> the, Paul here is. Uh, just a remark really on the appointment of the surgeons, the board had an establishment. Uh, so they said there will be three honoraries or four honoraries. Uh, and they were elected. But 
the important thing is something that I certainly remember, and I'm sure you will remember from the time that we were appointed, was the immortal phrase, canvassing will disqualify. <laughs> because otherwise you took the board out to the pub and gave them a big dinner. Uh, so you were not supposed to chat them up. Uh, although I absolutely what you understand what you say about nepotism. Uh, and of course, just to point out, it would have been impossible for any of the surgeons to be a Leeds graduate in the 19th century yeah. because the University of Leeds didn't appoint medical degrees until uh, the 20th century. Although, of course, they may well have walked the walks yeah. during that time and taken London degrees. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great talk, incidentally. Uh, there are lots of people congratulating you on the talk on the chat function, as you may be able to see. That's very kind. Do we have a, a last question, John? Well, in the absence of a question, I think it just falls to me to thank you, John, again, for that most interesting talk, very rich in information. I think telling us about a man none of us had heard of before and we hope that uh, maybe your own writings about him will give him the uh, fame that perhaps he deserves. And it's a great shame. And there's long history, isn't there, in medicine, of people coming up with correct ideas and being shunned by their colleagues and ha having to wait before their ideas actually catch on. And maybe Nunnally is in a, 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 a distinguished tradition in that <laughs> respect. Can we all show our appreciation for John in the traditional way, it's difficult with everybody muted, but I would encourage people to applaud.